I am Mahmoud Sharara. I'm a System Professor and Extension Specialist at North Carolina State University in the Bio and Ag Engineering Department. And again, my talk title today is Amendments for Improving Air Quality. And my, my talk today will, as you can see, um, that's really an overview of why do we talk about amendments uh, for air quality improvements inside animal operations. Um, and I will focus primarily on looking into ammonia, drivers for the formation of ammonia, and uh, a very little chemistry of why it forms. And then transition into all the different interventions to improve air quality inside animal houses. Uh, and uh, looking into the PPE and sensors for ensuring air quality standards inside animal operations. And with that, I'd like to jump in. So I really like to start generally with the, some of the headlines of a lot of the drivers of why we are interested in air quality or why air quality is uh, a significant concern today. A lot of the headlines wherever there are uh, areas of animal production, we see similar headlines, whether it touches on water quality or in this case, air quality. Um, here in North Carolina and other places uh, in the Eastern seaboard, you can see a conversation really converge around air quality odors and ammonia in particular uh, from an um, air quality perspective. These concerns can be uh, 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 a challenge both for uh, continued sustainable production and can be a cause for stresses. And generally speaking, that becomes a driver for us to start to look closely at air pollution, at the drivers of that in the agricultural settings and all the interventions we can make to control it. Uh, in, in air pollution in general, it's the presence of any contaminant that is chemical, biological, or physical that changes the properties of the atmosphere. And generally speaking, these changes are linked to negative outcomes, whether it is to human health, animal health, or into the environment around us, air quality and water quality, including a global impact that goes far beyond the region of production. Uh, an example of that, of course, is climate change. So generally speaking, when we talk about air quality from a regulatory perspective, air quality is regulated um, federally within the umbrella of the EPA uh, under the Clean Air Act. And that's really regulated through an ambient air quality standards um, that lists uh, two types of standards related to air quality, some primary standards and secondary standards. Each has its own goals, uh, whether to protect human health as a primary standard or visibility, animals, and vegetation as a secondary standard. And on the URL um, you see on the screen, it lists the, the table of all of these contaminants um, listed in that uh, inventory or in a, called in the standards. Those could include uh, particulate matter, and particulate matter is a primary concern for us in agriculture in general, mainly because it is uh, associated with field activities and animal production as well. We generally classify particulate matter or fine uh, dust in terms of its diameter or size of the particul uh, particulate matter. The picture on the right-hand side from the EPA resource shows relative size to uh, a human hair. So the basically um, compared to a human hair of a 50 to 70 micron, you can see uh, it's either 10 microns or even two to three microns. Um, so it can be significantly fine, and um, but contributes to a significant uh, environmental uh, uh, challenges. We also have nitrogen and sulfur oxides, carbon monoxide, ozone, and lead. Those fine uh, other contaminants are less of a concern to us in agriculture, more so in the industrial uh, setting. When we start to go into animal production, and I talk about poultry here in particular, we start to look into carbon dioxide, ammonia, reduced sulfur, volatile organic compounds, and uh, particulate matter. Those are the primary um, air pollutants or contaminants that we see in animal production. Um, carbon dioxide in of itself, depending on the concentration or the level of carbon dioxide can become a hazard both for the birds and for the, the operators inside production. And it starts to become a concern, especially in times where ventilation is minimized 
to conserve energy or for winter conditions and especially cold climates. Other gases, ammonia, sulfur, and volatile organic compounds are byproducts of the animal production, particularly manure activities. Obviously, the particulate matter or the dust is a combination of the animal activity inside the animal housing, in addition to the ventilation system that are used to, for air exchange. Uh, the chemistry of the air inside the barn, all of these become drivers of the particulate matter formation. As you can see on the slide in front here, I'm bolding ammonia in particular. That is really the focus of, of my talk today. And it is, it is a, a gas of concern, especially with poultry, but really across all of our species. And there's a lot of uh, renewed focus or interest in ammonia as an emission gas coming out of animal production. Ammonia is colorless, but odorous, and the odor is really recognizable for operators um, in poultry and animal production systems. It's highly alkaline, so it really, the chemistry of the environment can really alter whether it's kept or conserved or released into the environment. And its impacts can really affect the animals, whether that, that is birds or, or pigs or, or cattle. It's really, um, it's associated with respiratory tract issues, uh, inflammation. It can really become a compounding factor that um, exacerbate uh, or increase the risk of, of fungal infection and bacterial infection by uh, birds and animals. Uh, it's also associated at really continued exposure to high levels of ammonia, blindness may occur for birds in particular. Uh, foot pad for birds can have been, uh, lesions and inflammations have been associated with litter um, showing high levels of ammonia. So really from a production standpoint, it is really uh, a challenging uh, byproduct, but also for humans, whether this immediately the operators working in uh, animal confinement or animal environment, similar outcomes in terms of the respiratory complications, bacterial and fungal infections more recurring, and um, just perception that just the smell of ammonia itself, just uh, losing the ability to recognize the concentration or the smell of ammonia, which really kind of had a confounding effect of being able to get exposed to ammonia for without really having uh, recognizing the smell or trying to minimize that exposure. And finally, beyond that is really the particulate matter formation. Um, ammonia is really uh, one of the ingredients in chemical formation, uh, particulate matter. It also deposits beyond the farm boundaries on aquatic systems, on um, non-agricultural land, causing um, increased water quality uh, degradation, also acidification, and uh, also ammonia is a, an indirect greenhouse gas. So it really increases the formation of nitrous oxide, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So really these are kind of the, the whys of why we look in, into ammonia in particular in our animal production. Uh, OSHA or uh, occupational safety and health uh, 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 organizations typically identify 25 per parts per million as a recommended exposure limit for an eight hour uh, uh, of exposure. And, um, and similarly, the, the, the animal industry has, uh, in the poultry industry in particular, have identified that as a threshold to, to be an average level of ammonia in animal environments. We see ammonia uh, deposition, whether dry or wet. What you're seeing in front of you is a map of it's being wet deposited uh, with rainfall across the United States. These are really the primary drivers of these uh, uh, ammonia depositions. It's the synthetic fertilizer in a lot of our uh, heavy agricultural regions, but also our animal production uh, regions with heavy animal production. So really all of the, our agricultural activities are the primary drivers of ammonia in general, and by extension, it's deposition beyond the farm itself. If we started to look into the bird uh, broiler chicken for meat production in particular, and looking into ammonia in this, in this setting, we know that most of the nitrogen, 100% of the nitrogen that uh, cycles in the system comes in the feed form, protein and amino acids. And as it passes through the animal, we, we have this um, breakthrough of about 50% to 55% of that nitrogen 
is um, metabolized and kept uh, leaves the farm as protein on the carcass for processing and, and meat production or eggs. We have about 43 to 44% stays on the farm, whether in the form of mortality or excreted as manure. So that's a very important number to keep in mind that um, half of the nitrogen coming into the farm in the feed uh, only leaves with the protein and the rest stays on the farm. And most of that nitrogen, as you can see here, is a, uh, in a uric acid form. Uric acid is the primary form of nitrogen leaving the bird, 60 to 70%. And uric acid transforms to make um, uh, urea and in turn to form ammonia and carbon dioxide. This is really when we start to look into how the management uh, and the production decisions all impact the levels of ammonia produced. So the transformation between uric acid to urea and from urea to ammonia is heavily driven by the pH of the litter and the temperature and the moisture content. As the pH of the, the litter uh, or the bird environment start to increase, more of that ammonia is likely to volatilize. Same goes for the temperature and for the moisture. So really increases in pH and temperature and moisture drive that transformation from uric acid to urea and urea to ammonia. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side here is uh, a summary of some of the data that has been published uh, 2011 um, in a study that looked into the effect of moisture, temperature, and the combined effect of temperature and moisture on levels of ammonia. So what you're seeing here on the front, um, this is a baseline looking at a 20% moisture content litter at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And with the incremental increase of the amount of water or the moisture content in that litter, you're seeing the multiple increases in the amount of ammonia volatilized or the ammonia emissions. And you see a very significant impact of the temperature of that litter as the temperature jumps from 75 to 95, you have a two times increase of ammonia emissions regardless of the amount of water. So you can see an interplay of ammonia uh, emissions with the temperature and the amount of water in the uh, litter the, and the bedding for the, for the birds. And when we go back to the, 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 the mass balance of the nitrogen through a, a broiler farm, you can easily see here uh, the percentages where a significant amount of the nitrogen is lost of that half that stays on the farm, close to 20% or maybe more, depending on the management decision, can leave through the fan as nitrogen lost 20% or more, and the rest is conserved in the litter or in the cake, depending on the uh, litter management practices. That's another point of, of, of uh, uh, it's important to, to keep in mind is uh, the conserved nitrogen that is kept from volatilizing is value added into the litter in terms of a fertilizer, especially at a time where fertilizer prices are significant. That becomes a very another driver or an incentive to implement practices to keep ammonia from volatilizing in the, in the broiler or bird production in general. As we start to look into how do we go about reducing the ammonia volatilization in this production system, we can start from improvement in uh, the bird production uh, from genetics and additives in production uh, to feed and water additives. Um, and these can be um, prebiotics, probiotics, and or a mix of all of these feed formulation to reduce crude protein intake has been shown to reduce the ammonia emission in the uh, manure. Two uh, amendments that many of us are familiar with into the litter to modify its properties, uh, either increase its water holding capacity, uh, reduce its pH, or both. Some innovations in the space to reduce, to sh shift the production for broilers in particular to a litter free without bedding of any kind that's still uh, new in a uh, research and development phase, but it's been shown to have some positive results in reducing ammonia. And we see also the management decision related to the barn uh, ventilation, potentially misting or any interventions to trap uh, uh, particulate matter. 
Um, my focus here today is really on on amendments to control uh, uh, amendments to the litter, litter itself in the animal environment. Those are typically either acidifiers to shift to the pH towards um, very low pH to keep the ammonia from being gaseous, stay as ammonium, or could be an adsorbent or a, an absorber material that has a high capacity for uh, retaining water to reduce the water activity that drives the ammonia volatilization or the bacterial activity, or it could be an inhibitor, whether it's bacterial or enzymatic that interrupts this microbial action that takes uric acid to urea to ammonia. So really there is a whole spectrum of those three. Um, and we'll go briefly on the, the modes of action and the results to be expected from them. Again, for acidifiers, they are the most common intervention. That's what shifts the pH generally um, of the litter. And we try to shoot for pH below seven. And um, with that uh, reduction, the pH ammonia stays as ammonium and also uh, that very low pH inhibits microbial activities that break down uric acid. There's a very large number of acidifiers, and all of them are uh, based on um, either uh, um, different forms of uh, sulfides or chlorides uh, for the common interventions. Those are uh, sodium, sodium bisulfates, alum, sulfuric acid, um, uh, aluminum chlorides, and more recently, there's been interest in looking into organic acids, especially with the interest in, in uh, organic farming. Uh, many of these are not, do not qualify as organic intervention. And that's why the interest in the organic acids like citric acid or acetic acid, uh, potentially boric acids as well, um, to uh, serve the, the, the organic uh, broiler production uh, sector. What you're seeing in this is a, a result from looking into the impact of alum or aluminum sulfate amendment uh, compared to no amendment to the litter and how that impacts uh, the six weeks of the grow out period for bro broiler production. And you see on the vertical axis, the concentration of ammonia in the, in the barn. And you can see that with the uh, alum treatment, pH has uh, been reduced inhibiting the uh, ammonia and you can see that over time, the dark blue color indicating that the, the, the effect or efficacy of that amendment wears off over time, showing ammonia climbing, uh, as compared to no amendments with the concentration are well over 25 parts per million. You, you're seeing here the bisulfide effect um, uh, on uh, ammonia emissions and different levels of addition. So that's between 50 pounds um, of uh, amendments to 100 pound to 150 pound, and you see how these are effective in um, increasing the ammonia, uh, increasing the amendment, reducing the um, emissions. But there is that steady increase over time after the amendment that uh, the efficacy only lasts for the few weeks at the beginning of the cycle. This figure shows a similar trend here with the second week, fourth week, and sixth week, and with the progression of the grow out cycle for broilers, you see that the efficacy or the difference between the set of fires and the control start to wear off, both on the moisture and on the right hand side here on the pH. So, immediately, one of the, the valuable interventions in this case is to a reapplication or readdition of the set of fires. Um, and some Acidifiers are not safe for reintroduction in the uh, bird environment, but some of them are uh, generally regarded as safe or grass. And that, those are the ones that would be uh, safe to reapply. And you can see here from the study, reapplying this particular amendment and how uh, reapplication created the least amount of ammonia volatilized or lost during the production cycle. So beyond the acidifiers and their documented performance, we start to see zeolites and, and biochars as some of the materials that possess a very large surface area and has the ability to trap uh, the nitrogen to its surface and also hold onto the water um, and has a very high water holding capacity. That's what really reduces the ammonia emissions. And we start to see here different biochars and how they are able to uh, 
increase the water holding capacity in the litter as a result. And different biochar particle sizes can really impact the amount of water holding capacity in that litter. Also, when we talk about biochars, one of the important things to keep in mind that they are created different. Different biochars, depending on the parent material, is it based on wood, biomass, or grasses? Have they been acidified or activated in such a way? And you can see here, these are a, a, a group of active, uh, different biochars, and you can see here on the vertical axis is their capacity to absorb or absorb ammonia. Important to keep in mind that that y-axis here is jumps and tens, which means that they have a va vastly variable performance depending on how they have been prepared and their pH as well. Really, you can kind of see the pH, lower pH biochars have a better ability at trapping ammonia at higher amount of ammonia. So you start to see here on this figure, uh, kind of a big picture of the different interventions or how they can affect the amount of uh, uh, the reduction in ammonia. That's a recent survey that looked into all these different interventions, crude protein um, effect, um, acidifiers using electrostatic and acid scrubbers. They vary in their performance, but all of them have a positive effect in reducing the ammonia. These practices in general, it's important to think of them in combination with the management outside of the barn. And that's um, my colleagues talking after will we'll go over the different interventions outside of the house to ensure that the animal operation really uh, controls ammonia emissions throughout the life cycle of production, uh, all the way to land application. As we go towards the, the measurement, there is a, a vast way uh, array of technologies from ammonia testing strips that allows us to get a range of the amount of ammonia in the uh, environment, really low cost to uh, diffusion tubes or colorometer to uh, colorimetric tubes, slightly more expensive to a very, to highly expensive wearable detectors for one gas or multiple gases or continuous monitoring sensors inside the environment. And they, again, different sensors or measurement devices have different goals um, uh, for study and research purposes continuous monitoring might be necessary, but for routine operation, maybe a wearable detector might be sufficient for uh, technical service uh, providers and so on. Uh, similarly here, these are the, the protection or personal protective equipment. It's important to know some protect against dust, but not ammonia. Some protect against dust and ammonia. So uh, respirators are dust and particulate protection, but not ammonia protection. Then respirators with chemical cartridges are, can possibly be both the dust and ammonia, obviously a more advanced interventions depending on the environment. But in general, uh, wearing the right PPE is critical, especially for that continued exposure uh, to uh, animal production environment with high ammonia concentration and dust as well. So um, I apologize, I ran a little bit uh, on the longer side here, but it's important to look into air quality um, as a, a continuous area of improvement for production. Ammonia is one of the bigger areas of improvement in animal production. We see that ammonia uh, control requires an interplay between litter quality, pH, water, and temperature inside the barn. Acidifiers are the most effective repeated addition. Addition is probably more effect, uh, more efficacy to reduce ammonia. There are continued re research and development into amendments and interventions here. And we are actively working in that space and um, look forward to share with you your data as we generate them and put them out. Uh, to, and with that, I uh, want to thank you all.